Hi, everybody. I am Pablo Sabron. Uh, I am a research scientist at the SETI Institute, and my job is about looking for life and looking for resources in the solar system. My work is really looking not at the macro scale, but the micro scale. So you look at a telescope and you're looking you know, from, from here on Earth outside to a big picture. I am actually bringing microscopes to other planets so that we can look at the early signs of life, uh, at the chemical, molecular, and mineral uh, level. So uh, the way my work ties directly to the Zweck equation is that it's giving us a pattern of uh, how likely it is that uh, planets or planetary bodies uh, have hosted uh, chemistries that are conducive to life. So in other words, uh, we're trying to, to figure out how spread and how often uh, do planets uh, like Earth or like moons, like Enceladus out there in the space, how often do, do those present the chemistry that life likes to harness to evolve? When I was little, I was always looking uh, at the stars, right? And, and realizing that stars look so far out, but uh, but we almost can't touch them, right? And, you know, uh, I grew up in the 80s and the 90s and uh, in the post-Apollo uh, uh, Apollo times and really uh, seemed like there was a good time to really keep digging and learning more about uh, space. So uh, I steered my career into really providing the technologies and the tools for us to, to go out and discover secrets. Uh, first, of course, in our solar system, but eventually beyond. So I got connected uh, with the SETI Institute uh, uh, in the 2000s, 2007, and, uh, specifically uh, through a NASA award. And I spent a summer with colleagues at SETI Institute, and I fell in love with the mission of the Institute, this drive to really uh, explore, but tell the story, communicate the story, educate people, and make a space literate society. But as soon as I, as I had the tools, uh, to contribute to the mission, bring in some funding uh, from NASA to continue my work. I joined SETI without thinking it twice, obviously. Uh, I think this was 10, 12 years ago. And ever since, I've, I've really, really enjoyed uh, being part of our ever-expanding uh, mission to now not only look for radio signals, but you know, look for, for other signs of life, which is what my work uh, ties into, uh, using missions to Mars, missions to Europa, Enceladus, and other planets where we can actually dig into other aspects of the Drake equation from physical measurements on the ground. So uh, right now, uh, my, my most important project is about looking for biosignatures or life uh, really in the ocean worlds of our solar system. For the last four years, uh, we've been building, and now we have already tested and deployed uh, this system, uh, we built an underwater exploration robot that can find uh, organic molecules, pigments, corals, uh, habitats, minerals. It can do a whole suite of chemical, biological, mineralogical uh, explorations in the ocean, uh, not just the water, but the seafloor. So we, uh, we're, we're hoping that as uh, the community keeps uh, advancing new ways to, to visit uh, Europa, Enceladus, and other icy moons uh, out there, that we eventually find a way to crack through the ice of those moons and uh, reach the ocean. For those of you who don't know, we do know now that there are uh, oceans of liquid water in, in a lot of the moons of Jupiter and Saturn. The issue is what's in the water? Do we have chemicals in the water that we can tie to the presence of life, if not current life, past life in those moons? And so happens that, uh, that we think that life on Earth started in the ocean, right? In particular, in the, in the chimneys in the bottom of the, of the ocean that are bringing out uh, chemicals into the ocean. So what our project did last summer is to visit some of the systems on Earth, of course, and we were able to, for the first time, to give a very in-depth picture of the chemical interactions of life, fluids, and minerals in these unique settings on Earth. So that we're learning now uh, what we have to look for when we eventually reach the ocean worlds and deploy the same system, hopefully, to look for life out there. So I think, <clears throat> to me, it's a personal satisfaction, really, and personal win, being able to, to, to show this technology now on Earth. As I grew up near the ocean, and I've always uh, questioned what's under the ocean that I cannot see, now we can see it, right? So for the first time, we're bringing the most powerful lab, really, uh, that can be built for underwater. Now, SETI Institute has it. We build it, we test it uh, with NASA and NOAA and the NSF, and now we're ready to take it to the next level uh, to explore life in other planets. The future of my line of work is really uh, uh, going to be defined by our ability to, to miniaturize systems even further, uh, make our machines smaller, 
so they're cheaper and easier to, to launch to space and to operate. We're also be, going to be driven by automation, the use of uh, machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence to really uh, equip these robots in these machines with autonomy. Uh, think about how long it takes for signals to travel right between here and Mars. It's about 20 minutes, half an hour. If you're looking at oceans in Jupiter, Saturn on the moons, you're looking at hours of delay, uh, perhaps. So there is no joystick in uh, these robots, right? So so we need to to, to equip them with, with brains. They have to be scientists themselves, right? So so uh, this uh, militarization, automation, and third, uh, and perhaps even more importantly, it's about the whole context, right? Of how we understand the formation of these moons, how do we understand the history of the moons so that we can tie our observations today, I guess tomorrow, uh, we can tie the current observations with the, with the past uh, evolution of, of these systems. So these are the three the three waves, if you want, the three uh, curves of technology innovation that we're following in my line of work. And I think this is one of the things where, where SETI Institute is at the forefront of, uh, of the three of them. Uh, we have shown the work of some of my colleagues and myself that we can now uh, uh, design and build and operate uh, payloads, uh, instruments for doing science in space. I'm talking beyond telescopes. I'm talking about cameras, spectrometers, uh, systems that can actually give us uh, chemical mineral information out there. Uh, we've proven to the FDL program and other programs, uh, and of course, of all the uh, radio signal processing tools developed at SETI since the beginning, we have proven that we're at the forefront, if not leading the pack when it comes to machine learning and, and AI applied to signal decoding. And of course, you know, we have a breadth of expertise across this whole scientific domains from biology, chemistry, physics, engineering uh, uh, as of lately as well, so that we can really, really in-house uh, develop all these three vectors that I think are going to be the key to, uh, to put SETI Institute at the forefront of exploring and finding life uh, elsewhere where we do.